The process of writing is you sit in a room and you fire ideas out. I know sex. What, 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 what do you know? <laughs> they don't start as stories. They start as a Range Rover. Little observations. Slush puppies. You can be either too funny or you don't feel you're giving enough content. <laughs> Holy shit! It's nice, but not necessary, if there's a point. But well, Mrs Thatcher... That's uh, a licence for comedy not to be funny. In Britain, if you don't like a comic, you heckle them. In the Middle East, we hang them. I invent almost nothing. I, I embroider. What's that star? It's the death star. What does it do? It does death. It's all stuff they can grab hold of and go, oh, yeah. You're like, I have a flight tomorrow. I have to get up at four. four. I'm 22 years old. I still live with my parents. The best comics will be able to take you on a journey, tell you something interesting, make you think. I'm here. In a way, for me, it was discovering I had almost nothing to say. <laughs> wanted to go out, you felt like going out, and now you've done it. We might not be as verbally smart as they are over there. But you have to go back. <laughs> but our tradition is important. Steve. What is comedy? I'm loving being a part of this, this idea of elevating comedy to the status of art. Comedy is the ability to make people laugh without making them puke. What about the writing? Where do you get your material? Where does the material Where do I get my crazy ideas? Where do you tend to draw your material from? Do you actually write it down? I'm right at the beginning of the, of the process of writing a new show, which is the hardest part. People always think that with stand-up, the hard part is standing on stage because they can't imagine doing it themselves. That's fine. We're show-offs. I open my eyes as much as possible. I start looking at everything. I start going, oh, shoes, shoes, and any, any possible rubbish observation about floorboards or ceilings or anything. Oh, he's wearing glasses. I wonder what it would be if, he had, if there were three lenses on a glass. Even though it doesn't make any sense. No, pylons, why are they that shape? What if they were this shape? Next door's wind chimes. Because they're that shape because it's structurally sound. It makes sense for them to be that shape. I found a big thing on material is the day before stuff happened. At the moment, I'm doing the Stone Age, and the day before the Stone Age, when someone trips over a stone and goes, the fuck's sake? Things happen to you in your life, bad things sometimes, and you, you're, th you're, you're not thinking like a human being, you're suddenly thinking like a comic, you're like, what angle could I approach this from? I uh, had no sense of uh, inhibition about my private life. In fact, that would be what I would mine entirely. My husband and I split up, and I did jokes on Live at the Apollo. I remember I just liked the idea of an Indian bingo caller. Changing a light bulb. Import, S, export, cash and carry. Send by truck or send by ferry. Our chart, send it by freight. 88. And you do that for a couple of months, hopefully. Enough bare bones things appear. 88. I said, no, then it had to be a bit, a bit more. 88. You are just spending every waking hour with viewing everything in a skewed way. Do it, bad, do it, do it, do it, do it, bad, 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 33. It's just finding your voice and finding, finding what it is that you want to say or, or don't want to say. Um, and in a way for me it was discovering I had almost nothing to say. <laughs> I long to be on my own in the house sometimes. And it's just ruined by little sort of domestic things that you have to do. The washing machine, it finishes. Cool. I don't empty it, to be honest. I don't I just switch it on again. Fuck it. To go. <laughs> Often it's somewhat dismissed as, oh, it's observational comedy. But actually, it's, when it's done well, it's, I, think, uh, I think it's very exciting. If you watch it for 15 minutes, stock still, nothing. You go out to open it, it goes... <laughs> used to be quite simple, like buying a shampoo. Do you remember you used to be able to go into a shop? Excuse me, can I have a shampoo? They don't start as stories. They start as, as, as uh, little observations. You've got to boots the canvas. There's about five lanes of shampoo, six deep, all different colours, things you never heard of in your life. Jojoba. <laughs> what happened to soap? I said, what's so 
October. See, in Glasgow, that's the month before November. <laughs> I've always equated it to surfing. Like, the wave comes, but I'm not listening to it. I'm not glorifying and it, let it wash over me. I'm, I'm listening to the sort of timbre of it. And when it gets to a certain point, I step onto it. What kind of hair is it for? I said, pubic hair. <laughs> so you find that in your fancy labels, you bastard. Because they're actually talking to you. They're actually saying, oh, that was very good. And before they get the word good out. <laughs> Do you know what's always intrigued me? The way pubic hair only grows to a certain length and then stops. I think it would be brilliant, you know, if your pubic hair just kept growing. <laughs> Right out the legs of your trousers. <laughs> and it starts to take shape, and then it becomes a completely different thing than it started out. And you can brush it. You can, you can brush it. A hundred strokes a night. <laughs> and when Billy Connolly is there showing you doing his, you know, his routine, you know, his, his grooming with the, with the, the, Jojoba shampoo, you're there with him. You can, you, you know, you're in a room with three and a half thousand people, but everybody is in the same place. You can bite comb it. When I think of Billy Connolly's shows, it's like, you know, when BBC One shows all its programmes again, but for, with a deaf woman standing next to him. He said, it's like that. I can see him. He's the little woman in the corner telling the story, but I can see the stories that he's telling. That's what I remember about those routines. <laughs> That's amazingly powerful. There's a lesson for us all there. Don't squander your money in hair conditioners. Wear underpants on your head. <laughs> what do you think? Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Seinfeld. He was one of the first people to talk about normal life uh, in a way that, sort of, that took it away from very ordinary observational comedy and into something kind of modern, you know, that there was a sort of modernity and, a, a, and an urbanness, I guess, a New York sophisticated urbanness, the way he talked about life. But I love to travel, I love it whether it's a car or it's a plane, I like to get out there, I like to keep it moving. I love airports, feel safe in airports, thanks to the high caliber individuals we have working at X-ray security. <laughs> How about this crack squad of savvy, motivated personnel? <laughs> the way you want to set up your airport security is you want the short, heavyset woman at the front with the skin tight uniform. <laughs> That's your first line of defense. You want those pants so tight, the flap in front of the zipper has pulled itself open. You can see the metal tangs hanging on for dear life. When Jerry Seinfeld spends a lot of time thinking and focusing on a very small thing, he's sort of saying, this is the art of the inconsequential. That is both funny and in it is the seeds of comedy's own downfall. You are both doing something brilliant and sort of saying, and that's why I won't win any awards and be considered, you know, as important as Beethoven. No, but I will be a multi, yeah. multi-millionaire. Yeah, yeah, Not bad. No, that's true. That's exciting. The Olympics is really my favorite uh, sporting event, although I, I think I have a problem with that silver medal. I think if I was an Olympic athlete, I would rather come in last than win the silver, if you think about it. You know, you win the gold, you feel good. You win the bronze, you think, well, at least I got something. But you win that silver, that's like, congratulations, you almost won. <laughs> of all the losers, you came in first of that group. <laughs> You're the number one loser. I think when people write comedy and begin to write comedy, a lot of the time they mistake that, the idea of the communality of it. So what they do is they think what is in the community chest of shared knowledge that I can sort of tap into and they try and find something like that. I remember when I was just starting, people might talk about, say, um, uh, you know, train spotters wearing anoraks as a kind of cliche of that. Whereas, in fact, what you should do is find something idiosyncratic about your own life and your own self and then you put it in the dark and then you hope that people know about it. Now, Critics of Michael McIntyre will say that's why he's a generic comedian who deals with ordinary stuff, OK? But he'd done quite a bit about asking for directions, and then he got microscopic. But it's also someone who's clearly thought, OK, asking for directions, I'm going to find the sort of deep specifics. I'm going to go to the deep space of asking for directions until I find something so kind of, you know, complicated and baroque about what you can get into that it'll be really funny and new. 
And that is where that old fashioned comedy becomes a brilliant art form, I think. Eddie is a natural comedian because he, he understands the juxtaposition of, of reality and craziness. He understands humor. There's got to be some reality against some flight of fantasy. Well, I mean, they're the Death Star. Death Star is a very, almost like a New York name. The Death Star. It gets to the point. What's that star? It's the Death Star. What does it do? It does death. <laughs> it does death, buddy. Get out of my way. You with your centiliters and your milliliters. <laughs> your fucking combine harvesters. I used to hitch up from London to Sheffield Uni for about three or four years, and it was getting off at service stations or being dropped off at service stations, and, um, and it was Darth Vader probably at Leicester Forest East service station. There must have been a Death Star canteen, yeah? There must have been a, a cafeteria downstairs in between battles where Darth Vader could just chill and go down. I will have the penne a la arrabbiata. <laughs> You'll need a tray. Do you know who I am? The first stand-up I got into was Eddie Izzard. I remember saving up for his VHS tapes. I can kill you with a single thought. Well, you'll still need a tray. <laughs> no, I will not need a tray. I do not need a tray to kill you. And I was really uh, intrigued by how he was making what he was saying. I didn't know why it was funny, and I would just felt like I needed to figure it out. <laughs> because he was what, so Jeff unique and so original. No, I can kill you without a tray, with the power of the force, which is strong within me, even though I could kill you with a tray if I so wished. <laughs> For I would hack at your neck with the thin bit until the blood flowed across the canteen floor. No, the food is hot. You'll need a tray to put the food on. Oh, I see the food is hot. I'm sorry, I, I did not realise. I transcribed a couple of the tapes just to figure out what he was doing, because it just seems so... It wasn't like set-up punch. It's like, what's he doing? I still don't know, really, but I sort of would underline words, go, well, that, is that the rule of three? I don't know what that is. It's 